thank you, um, uh, Chair Wall, Commissioners, and Director Melcher. Thank you for uh, letting me present today. Uh, for the record, my name is Shayana Steingas. I'm the ODFMW Marine Mammal Program Leader. I'll pre uh, be presenting you today with an update of the Marine Mammal Program for your consideration. Uh, there's a lot of information here, so I'd be very happy to answer any questions or revisit slides um, at the end of the talk, or you're also welcome to contact me anytime. Uh, so starting off, the Marine Mammal Program has several main year-round objectives. Uh, these objectives are listed here, and they include the research of behavior and ecology of pinnipeds on Oregon's uh, coastline, as well as uh, Oregon's river and environments. We perform population and distribution surveys of pinnipeds, assess salmonid predation at coastal and inland sites, we provide scientific evaluation of predation on fisheries resources, as well as threatened and endangered species. Uh, and we collaborate with other states, tribes, and the National Marine Fisheries Service to manage predatory pinnipeds at designated sites in the Columbia River Basin. We began uh, sea lion management, specifically California sea lion management, at Willamette Falls in 2019. And this occurred after nearly a decade of uh, attempted hazing, uh, translocations, and monitoring of predation. Uh, we were fortunately successful last year in our uh, management efforts, and I'm personally hopeful that we were able to get on top of um, a habituation problem um, and remove those individual sea lions that habitu um, had habituated before others continue to follow them to this location. Uh, so 2019 was the first year of lethal management. Uh, in total, we uh, captured and removed 33 um, adult male California sea lions. Um, just as a side note, all of the California sea lions are uh, in Oregon are male. Uh, the females stay further south in California. Um, I believe there's one female California sea lion in Washington right now, and that's actually a rehabilitated animal that um, had uh, previously had demogue acid poisoning, which makes them lose their navigational abilities. Um, so uh, when the animals migrated south back to California in May uh, to occupy breeding sites, uh, we had captured and removed all but eight um, identified, uh, individually identified animals that qualified for removal. Um, in total, there's still 37 animals out there that are qualified for removal at Willamette Falls, but we don't know how many of these um, and when uh, these animals may return in 2020. So uh, for example, this diagram uh, depicts California sea lion presence on a weekly basis for actual, uh, for four different scenarios. So I'll walk you through this. Um, hopefully you can see the colored lines there. So. In blue, what you see is sea lion presence, uh, again, California sea lion presence at Willamette Falls in 2017 through 18. You can see that it peaks around uh, mid-March through the end of May um, when the animals migrate south. So in dotted pink, uh, what you see is projected continued presence of California sea lions uh, in 2018 through 2019 without removals. So this is what we would have expected to see had we not done any management. In red is the actual presence of California sea lions last year um, <coughs> in winter 2018 with removal efforts. And this very optimistic green line on the bottom there is the actual presence of California sea lions at Willamette Falls this season. And that so far has been zero. So this diagram uh, here depicts winter steelhead this fish passage at Willamette Falls in uh, last season, so winter 2018 through 2019. That's in red, um, and green is fish passage thus far uh, this winter. So um, a couple takeaways are that with the 33 animals removed, uh, the previous predation rate of up to 25% of winter steelhead has now dropped down to 7%. Um, in uh, last year, we had a really wonderful return of over 3,000 fish 
up from an all-time low in 2017 of just over 500. Uh, so what you'll see here is we still have to wait and see what the fish passage, passage looks like. And it will be several years before we can fully assess effects of uh, management, but we do, it looks like we have a bit of a jump start this year um, as compared to last. Now this is a particularly interesting uh, diagram. So this is a diagram um, of both California and stellar sea lion presence at Willamette Falls in 2018 through 19. So I won't focus on stellar sea lions, which are at the bottom. Um, I'll focus you up, up top at the California sea lion aspect. So the red lines or the pink lines here show the projected number of days that those animals would have been present based on previous years uh, had they not been removed. So a red line represents a removal. Um, in total, we had 44 identified California sea lions in 2018 through 19. As I said, uh, we removed uh, in total 33 of those. Um, and there was an additional animal that was removed um, due to uh, public safety in an unrelated matter um, that was qualified for removal at Willamette. So what you'll see are the yellow boxes indicate animals that were um, marked but not trapped. And uh, what we're seeing this year, based on that green line that I showed you earlier, is that we may be expecting animals not to show up until mid-March or April, um, which is very optimistic and, and looking positive. Uh, so we will have to continue to monitor that to see if that's the case. Um, but this really is evidence of that learned habituation behavior. All marine mammals are very social learners. Um, and because of the isolation of Willamette Falls, I think we can expect success in future years. Um, that's positive both for salmon and sea lions that we were able to get on top of this. So we continued management at Bonneville Dam in 2019, um, as we have been for over a decade. Um, it was a relatively light year at that location. Um, so in comparison of the 33 animals removed at Willamette, there were 19 adult male California sea lions removed at Bonneville Dam. Uh, that was over half of the animals present, which actually is an unprecedented uh, percent of removal, so we were very successful. Um, and part of that was because uh, previously the criteria for removal included uh, that the animal, animal be individually identifiable, that it be seen eating salmon, and that it be caught or present for five days. Um, so that criteria has now changed to and or, so the animal has to be present or seen five times on five different days, or be seen eating a salmonid. Um, the stellar sea lion presence, uh, conversely, at Bonneville Dam is increasing. Uh, there were, is a raft of more than 40 adult stellar sea lions, those are males as well, that are rafted at Bonneville Dam and they've actually shifted their consumption to, to salmonids, um, so they're now out eating California sea lions. Um, we'll resume management of California sea lions under the same authorizations uh, this spring season. So there, there haven't been California sea lions present yet, but they probably will be in the next month. So a new change to our operations is coming under the Endangered Salmon uh, Predation Prevention Act. This act will remove that criteria that animals have to be individually identifiable and be seen eating salmon. So um, instead of this very restrictive um, catch and release site-based effort, animals that are above River Mile 112, um, for your reference, that's about the Portland airport, um, based on dietary analyses are really presumed to be eating primarily salmon. Um, in some cases, it's 85% to 99% um, of, of their diet. Um, uh, therefore, animals above this area will qualify for removal. Um, another important aspect of this is that this also includes stellar sea lions. Um, so this application was submitted prior this year and the sea lion task force meeting will be held in May uh, at which point NIMPS, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, will determine approval or denial of applications with specific conditions for both species, which we must follow. 
So um, revisiting that stellar sea lion management, uh, we plan to begin this management in fall 2020, pending NIMS approval. Um, this will be a very similar program to California sea lion management and will be fully collaborative between all of the parties noted um, below. Uh, one of the most important things we do as a program is to work collaboratively with our management partners. Um, Bonneville is going to be a primary site to begin this management, uh, in part because it's a collaborative site um, and we'll all be training. Um, they're also regularly using the traps there and uh, we have we actually have trail cams where we monitor the animals and, and they've been there pretty consistently over the last several months. Um, I also believe that Bonneville is a source site for some of the animals that show up at Willamette Falls. And so reduced competition there uh, will probably result in less animals going up to the falls uh, itself. So another challenge with Willamette Falls is that the stellar sea lions uh, less frequently use the traps that we have set up there. So trapping is a little more difficult. Um, however, it's, it is our radar to begin those removals, but it's going to be dependent on the animals at that site. Uh, so quite literally, stellar sea lions are a completely different animal than California sea lions. Um, uh, we have a few key considerations, including safety, logistics, collaborative interagency teamwork, establishing protocols and ramping up these operations, and uh, perhaps most importantly, careful, ethical, and deliberate work. So I just wanted to bring to your attention um, that stellar sea lions are more than twice the size of California sea lions in some cases. Um, and a large stellar sea lion bull can weigh over 2,000 pounds. So for your reference, uh, that is more than twice the size of an adult male polar bear. Uh, seen above is a stellar sea lion skull, um, just for your interest, next to a grizzly bear. The grizzly bear is on the left. The stellar sea lion uh, with those impressive teeth uh, is on the right. And uh, on the bottom there, what looks like a juvenile and an adult uh, sea lion is actually an adult male California sea lion sleeping next to a fairly decently sized uh, stellar sea lion bull. So we'll start with a ramp up period this fall, working with one animal at a time to establish protocols. And I think an important communication point is that we're going for the marathon method, not the sprint method with this. Um, we're gonna be working carefully and ethically uh, with the realization that missteps could result in litigation, which could permanently or temporarily put a hold on the program, um, or could result in significant safety hazards for uh, staff. Um, this is even more important working in an interagency team. Uh, so thanks to agency and legislative support, uh, we've expanded our program's capacity in the last year or so to perform both management and resume uh, delayed coastal research that has been precluded by management in recent years. Um, we were able to expand the program from four full-time permanent staff to seven full-time permanent staff, as well as seasonal biological sci science assistants. Uh, this has really big implications for our program's capacity to do more diverse work that will inform management action in the future. Um, so the new positions are, are shown here. So we've added a supervising fish and wildlife biologist, uh, an assistant project leader, a management technician, um, as well as several monitoring positions, which are really important uh, for NIMPS guidelines in assessing predation. So uh, most notably, notably, these expansions uh, mean we can resume our capacity for coastal research. Um, so uh, that includes stellar sea lions, California sea lions, and harbor seals. We're resuming our aerial surveys uh, for population assessment for stellar sea lions and harbor seals uh, this summer. And this is very important because our data uh, really needs to be renewed um, and is actually used to create population assessment models by the National Marine Fisheries Service. They rely directly on our data. Uh, we're continuing, continuing to conduct in-river and east mooring basin sea lion counts and recites of branded animals. That's also in collaboration with uh, the NOAA NIMPS Marine Mammal Lab. Uh, we'll be increasing our assessment of pinniped ecology on the coast with a particular emphasis on movement and dietary assessment of harbor seals. Um, 
And although now we're effectively split into what we're calling research and management branches, we continue to be a very cohesive program, which allows us more flexibility to conduct seasonal year-round work. Um, so here's a calendar of our planned uh, work for 2020. Uh, the light blue indicates setup for field months. So now through May, we are prepared to uh, do any Willamette Falls, California sea lion management. April and May with setup in March uh, is Bonneville Dam season uh, for California uh, management, and that's with other agencies. June through July is when we're gonna be conducting those aerial surveys for harbor seals and stellar sea lions along the coast. Um, and then September and November, we are gearing up for uh, stellar sea lion management, uh, August essentially through November. Um, in December, hopefully, we can maybe take a bit of a vacation. So uh, with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time and consideration, um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Mr. Wooler. Good morning, Sheila. Um, so what are the criteria that are considered on how many animals to remove? How do you, how do you determine that? Chair Wall, um, Commissioner Woolley, that's an excellent question. So those numbers are known as potential biological removals or PBRs, not to be confused with the beverage. Um, <laughs> and that is determined by the Marine Mammal Lab um, through NIMS. So what they do is uh, they utilize their population assessment models as well as incidental takes from fisheries um, and then uh, they give us a number which is usually actually 1% of that potential biological removal. So PBR is the level at which individuals can be removed without harming the population. So um, we're essentially working at 1% of that. Uh, that equivocates to 93 animals per year, and actually that's recently been increased, I believe, to 104. However, there's actually not that many animals even there. Um, so a bit of an unfortunate um, I guess incidence is the media will often pick up on that 93 or 100 number and mm -hmm. extrapolate that by a decade. Um, but the reality is there's not that many animals present. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got a couple more questions. So why, why are there so many males, predominantly males, in, the, in this uh, Glamour Falls population? Is that, what, what's sort of the life history background of that? Uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Woolley. Um, so just to clarify, you're asking about just the life history of the animals that are at Willamette or? Um, yeah, so these are all uh, males, usually sub-adult or adult males. Um, generally, they're not enormous, but some of them are a bit larger. And so a lot of these animals, um, it seems like there, there are a few established animals, larger bulls, and uh, often case a sub-adult or younger male will follow this animal up river um, because clearly he's doing something right because he's successful. Um, mm -hmm. And they will essentially habituate to this site and for the entire time they're in Oregon, they will remain at this area. Um, so the, the animals that were removed last year were animals that had been there for a decade. Um, and so every time there's more animals at one of these sites, it actually increases the chances uh, that another animal will follow them up. So um, at Bonneville, it seems that about 7% of sea lions that are present in the East Mooring Basin or Lower Columbia make their way up to Bonneville Dam. <coughs> okay, then just a couple more quick ones. Uh, so how many of the staff are focused on research versus how many are focused on management or is there overlap with, with staff responsibilities? Right, Chair Wall and uh, Commissioner Woolley, that's an excellent question as well. Um, so we try to overlap everything to increase our programmatic capacity. So for example, our management branch um, also is largely involved in our aerial survey efforts. Um, and so currently on um, technically the research side, uh, there's me and I and I'm you know uh, do both branches. Uh, Brian Wright, who is our project leader, Susan and Susan Reamer, who is our assistant project leader. Um, the rest of the staff are assigned to the, oh, and we have, we also have two um, seasonal predation monitors. The rest of the staff are assigned to the management branch. Um, and this year is going to be quite busy because we're, we're transitioning those stellar sea lion captures to fall. 
um, depending on our success, we may shift those to where we're dealing with both species concurrently in the spring, but maybe one day we'll do stellars, one day we'll work with Californias. Um, and that will increase our, our capacity to uh, resume coastal research. So um, I'm very proud to say everyone on my team is an expert uh, biologist and um, animal handler and boat handler. So we have a lot of amazing capability. Okay, last question. Um, what happens with the carcasses of the animals that are killed? Yes, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Woolley, uh, another <coughs> good question. Um, so currently, uh, a full necropsy <coughs> is conducted of the animals uh, by veterinarians, and we uh, contribute samples to a number of studies, um, including immunology, parasitology, um, and most recently, toxicology, um, which is really going to be interesting for the Columbia River Basin. Um, just gathering data in terms of that. Um, and hopefully with stellars, we can do the same. Uh, so after uh, necropsy is completed, samples are collected, uh, the animal is then actually rendered. Um, so we've considered incineration as a possibility. Um, however, I have, I have some uh, concerns on that in terms of the heavy metal content in these animals. Um, so we would have to just assess if that's uh, an appropriate disposal method, um, but it, that could be somewhat promising as well. Um, yeah. Okay. So the metals in, in terms of impact on air quality with the incineration? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Feldman. Yeah. Good report. Uh, and I don't think we have copies in our folders here of the report. Is that available online? Um, <laughs> Chair Wall and Commissioner Spellbrink. Um, the uh are you referring to the my presentation or yes, yes. um so it certainly can be yes we'll it, yeah i would it is available. i would love to have a copy yeah. I, you know i get asked by Wonderful. where where are we at in the sea land program what's going on and you know it's like uh well i don't know i know they're doing a good job but anyway, <laughs> anyway uh and uh yeah i can attest that from experience you know i think one of the years i was down there fishing i lost five uh, spring salmon in a row with sea lions. You know, we finally just left because we obviously weren't going to get any in the boat. So I, I, I'm glad to see the, the program uh, enhanced. And then the other question I had was on uh, stellars. And the uh, I didn't hear anything mentioned about the uh, interaction with sturgeon. Have you been observing? Have you, are, how, how's that going? Yes, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Spellbrink. Um, so uh, Tucker will be touching on sturgeon predation a little bit, but yes, so our predation monitors at Willamette Falls are continually monitoring predation events. It's actually been fairly slow this year in terms of stellar sea lion predation, which we're, we're a little um, confused about. They're, they're there, but we're not seeing much. Um, we also, um, very fortunately, were able to team up with uh, the city of Portland, and we're working with um, OSP as well to, uh, to give them some data collection apps. <coughs> Uh, so they can actually start collecting data on predation events that we can at least use anecdotally for future comparison. Right, I've heard, you know, like in the past, that even they'll put stress on the sea lion population, or I mean the uh, sturgeon population. Uh, you know, like I observed both at Bonneville Dam, where the sturgeon seem to congregate there, and then also at Lima Falls. And uh, so you have, have you done any research? Has, has there been some research done on as far as the effect on the uh, spawning is right. of the sturgeon? Yeah, so Chair Wall and Commissioner Spellbrink. Um, yes, so that is done primarily by the sturgeon team, and they do um, population modeling that includes predation. Um, and I would say interestingly, um, or at least anecdotally on our end, what we have seen is a shift in stellar sea lions from eating almost exclusively sturgeon at Bonneville Dam to eating a very high percent of salmonids. So uh, the mechanism for that's not entirely known. Um, it could be either behavioral uh, because there's so many salmon um, or it could be because there's just because there's less sturgeon um, so that will I think become more clear in future years and I, I saw the report too that you know that right now I guess in the Oregon City area and there's just stellars are there right now and it mentioned in the report or something like that they were seen foraging but didn't say what they were foraging on so are what are they eating right now those stellars in, in that Oregon City area right um, chair wall and commissioner Spellbrink. Um, uh, so primarily it looks like, the, so it doesn't, there have not been very many salmon predation events noted. Um, I was up visiting with our monitors last week, um, or this week actually, gosh. Uh, and uh, so it seems to be primarily sturgeon, um, which is expected. So, so in the Willamette, it does seem like they are eating 
a large percent of sturgeon. Um, but again, at Bonneville, it's, it seems to be salmon. So there's something strange going on there. Um, neither species, uh, Stellars or Californians, are traditionally uh, specific predators. They're very, um, they're very general in their diet in the ocean. So this is a really unique circumstance. Great, great, appreciate it. Really good report, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your report, Shelley. So I have a um, one, one comment and question. Very informed, appreciate it very much. And so I, uh, last night at the reception at the Sportsman Show, I did get questions on seals. And so I think your information is going to be very valuable. So I really appreciate you doing this and getting us that information so that I have the factual information. So uh, first question, uh, the expansion of the positions, how were those funded? Where did the funding come from for those additional positions? Right, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Lava. Um, so through uh, several different mechanisms. So first of all, um, before the policy option package went through this biennium, uh, those positions were funded through, um, one through federal funding, which allowed uh, additional funding for Willamette Falls management. Um, as well as Columbia River endorsement funds. So some of those funds went directly to sea lion management, which um, folks seem generally um, happy about to see the results of that. Um, and then currently this biennium, we are very fortunately awarded uh, the policy option package, which included permanent funding uh, this biennium for many of those positions. So general fund? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the, this will show my lack of knowledge on seals, but do we have any research that shows when a sea lion comes up to Willamette Falls, how many fish do they eat? Do we have any kind of, I mean, what's the impact? I mean, I know we're, we, the numbers go up and down, but one seal, how much does one seal eat? Right. Um, um, Chair Wall and Commissioner Labhart, uh, that's a great question. And so we do know that answer. And again, it goes back to that very strange behavior where they're only eating one species. Um, anywhere else on the coast, it's incredibly difficult to assess, um, you know, energetically how many fish a sea lion's eating per day. So up at Willamette Falls, uh, based on energetic estimates uh, by our project leader, Brian Wright, uh, they're eating an assumed three to five salmon a day per animal. So I think what's really remarkable about that is uh, the animals that, so the run um, in previous years, if it was about 2,000 fish, uh, the animals that were present at Willamette Falls were eating about that amount. Um, so in effect, uh, it, it's very possible that removing these animals is, actually has the capacity to save that run of winter steelhead at Willamette Falls. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? That was my same question. How oh. many do they eat? <laughs> One more question, maybe. Sure. So that was on winter steelhead, basically. Because I, I would guess that, you know, from being down there and being around those animals that are when the springers are there in much larger quantity that they would eat more. You know, you see them throwing fish all the time. That's correct. I would, I would guess they'd probably eat more than that when the springers are you know, yeah. there all the time. Commissioner Walder, did you have one more question? No, I just had a couple of comments that I would. Oh, okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't, wait, wait. I have one more. Oh, Miss Ugonwick. Uh, we're way down here. <laughs> um, I have one question. Uh, a while ago, we were just um, trying to remove them a number of years ago. Uh, I remember reading some reports that said um, that almost every sea lion that was removed had cancer. And I'm just wondering if you're still seeing those things and why would they have cancer? Right, um, Chair Wall and Commissioner Zarnowitz, uh, this is a particular area of interest for me, um, is, is uh, you know, mammalian health. Um, so, yeah, so, and just as a note too, we, you know, it's in the attempted uh, work at Willamette Falls, we moved a dozen sea lions in 2017, or 2018, sorry, um, and 11 of those came immediately back. Um, one animal didn't return, um, and some of them swam 100 miles a day to return to the site. Um, so uh, both at both Willamette and Bonneville Dam, uh, we're conducting, continue to conduct that research. Um, and so uh, because a lot of these pinniped populations are at or near carrying capacity, uh, what we would expect is, you know, um, at that level, that because they don't have a lot of major predators that uh, actually affect the populations in a large way, 
uh, disease is going to be a major limiting factor. Um, and that's something folks don't realize with marine mammals because we don't see them all the time is um, there's a lot of major diseases, uh, both macro and micro parasites, as well as cancer that largely uh, regulate those populations. Um, and so, yes, both in our management work as well as um, our other monitoring operations, there's a very high percent of that um, herpes virus. Uh, it's called Odorion herpes virus, um, and it it contributes to that that cancer. Um, so that's still ongoing. That's kind of a collaborative study. Uh, but it's really interesting because that's something um, I think a value of this program as well. Um, with the regulations of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we're able to conduct research on, on samples that otherwise wouldn't be available. Um, and that's something that's been really surprising to find. Um, so that's going to continue. And um, uh, our veterinarian, Julia Burko, is, is working on heading that up with folks from um, the Marine Mammal Center. Thank you. Jay, I did have one question. The, the removals, are all of them lethal or are some of them actually removals and not lethal? Right, Chair Wall, um, that's a great question. So uh, previously, uh, there were many attempted translocations, um, it, some as far as California, and those, actual, those animals actually returned also. Um, so the first thing, that the first option anytime we have an animal that qualifies for removal is that uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service puts a call out every season to zoos and aquarium um, that would like to take on that animal. So we've actually rehoused 15 sea lions. Um, unfortunately, I think with the unusual mortality events in the strandings uh, several years ago, a lot of facilities took on a lot of animals. Um, as you might imagine, they're fairly expensive to maintain. Um, and so uh, for California sea lions, we haven't had any requests lately. Uh, for stellar sea lions, we're actually going to attempt some translocations uh, during spring management season. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens with those, those animals. Um, I'm, I'd also like to put some tracking tags on them if we, if we do move them to see where they go if they don't come back and, and how long it takes. Um, yes. Thank you. One, one more question. I know, you, I know you just said spring uh, management, no, but that would be next spring. I saw that it looked like stellar mm -hmm. management this year started in September, something like that. Right, uh, Chair Wall and Commissioner Spellbrink. Um, yeah, so we can actually still, we do have a research authorization in general ma non-lethal management work um, for stellar sea lions. So we can uh, move them and track them under all of our associated permits. Um, however, that uh, Salmon uh, Predation Prevention Act will not go into effect until fall. So it's a great time to start assessing those yeah, questions. Yeah, start to get the logistics down how to handle those Correct. things. Correct. Appreciate it. Great. Like I said, really appreciate it. Thank you. 